morning, Counsel. Good morning, Your Honor. Michael Sams for the Appellant Bar, Incorporated. May I proceed, Your Honor? Yes, sir, please. Your Honors, the public bidding laws provide limits within which an authority, an awarding authority, may review a contractor for purposes of determining whether that contractor is responsible under the public bidding laws. Those, the public bidding laws limit an awarding authority's review to reviewing the update statement that the contractor provides, to reviewing the certification file for that contractor that DCAM maintains, and to contacting project references for those projects listed in the update statement. Those projects specifically concern projects completed by the contractor since it was last certified by DCAM, and those projects that are ongoing since DCAM last certified. Let me see if I understand your position. Are you saying that the lowest bidder automatically should be entitled to the contract? No, sir. The awarding authority has an absolute duty to assess responsibility. That is, responsibility, the review of responsibility under our public construction laws is actually shared. That is, DCAM performs a part of the function, and then at the end of the day, through a prescribed process under 44D, as required by 44A of Chapter 149, the awarding authority is to review the update statement, the DCAM file, and to contact project references from the update statement to ascertain for itself whether, based on that information, the contractor is particularly responsible for its, so that it can perform on its project. So, for instance, if an awarding authority went to the DCAM certification file and found that, you know, some of the particular awards showed that, or particular standard form evaluations from prior completed projects by that contractor showed that despite receiving overall passing evaluations, and despite being certified by DCAM, that contractor had a particular problem, for instance, with timely completing its project, that notwithstanding the fact that DCAM had found that contractor eligible and responsible and certified the contractor, based on the awarding authority's review, it could determine. But surely, in the course of doing that, do you disagree that the town certainly has not only the right, but the obligation to contact the individuals listed in those files, the responsible parties, perhaps, the cities and towns or private entities that actually awarded the contracts to sort of follow up on these issues? No, Your Honor. So they can't contact them, they can just... No, you say they can contact who's listed in the update statement. They can contact the references listed in the update statement. I'm talking about the certification process, because that involves also an evaluation of lots of prior jobs. Yes. And you're saying the town cannot, however, contact those people? No, it cannot. Why not? Well, for a couple reasons, Your Honor. First, if towns are allowed to conduct a review outside of what is provided for in 44D, then we go back to the pre-ward days, where towns are permitted to conduct whatever investigation they feel is appropriate, bounded only by abusive discretion standards. We know that that system didn't work, based on the Ward Commission's findings, that it allowing awarding authorities to determine their own review process... But the field of those they're reviewing is now limited to those that have already gone through that initial process. So you don't have what you had pre-ward. Well, you... You have a very different scenario. Now you've got entities or individuals who've been screened and are at this level for further assessment. But respectfully, Your Honor, I disagree. What the Ward Commission found was that, in part of what it found, was that awarding authorities were conducting whatever type of review they wanted to. And that was one of the purposes, that was one of the reasons that led to the graft and corruption and improper awarding of contracts that the Ward Commission found. If we were to permit the awarding authority today to be able to conduct its own investigation based on what it felt was appropriate, bounded only by the confines of arbitrary and capriciousness, we'd be right back there. That is, we would have this uniform process that Your Honor just alluded to, where DCAM vets these contractors based on a uniform review of their financial condition, their bonding capacity, their project history, the experience of their people, as well as their performance on prior jobs, only to have awarding authorities have the discretion to yank the rug out from under them at the last second. 
The, the and do, I'm sorry. No, you, I interrupted you. You finish. I, I was going to say pull out the rug from under them at the last second and allow the awarding authority to conduct whatever type of review it wanted, putting us right back to where we were before the ward commission findings. Do, do you think, I mean, both the statute and the regulation that you are relying on, I believe, use language that doesn't, I mean, when you say it's limited to these things, that's really begging the question, isn't it? I mean, the, the statutory and regulatory language at least is open to an interpretation that the awarding authority must consider and weigh these sources, but isn't necessarily limited to them. Uh, you can't, you, in other words, the awarding authority couldn't award uh, a contract permissibly without having taken into account all that information. But it doesn't necessarily, at least by their terms, these particular provisions don't seem to me to be, to compel a reading that, that an awarding authority is absolutely limited to those sources, can't contact somebody who isn't, uh, listed as the um, uh, contact person on the update statement, but somebody else who works for that particular contractor. Uh, I, Your Honor, respectfully, I believe a plain reading of the language requires a contrary conclusion. If, if as you review 44A, section 44A, subpart D2, what it provides is that all public construction contracts shall be awarded to the lowest eligible and responsible bidder right. in accordance with sections 44A through 44H inclusive. I would suggest to you that the use of the word inclusive is instructive in answering the question that you just posed. That is, uh, the standard, the plain meaning of inclusive, in fact, if you look it up in Merriam-Webster's dictionary, it provides that it, it is defined as comprehending stated limits or extremes. But, but does, I mean, usually when that is used in a statutory uh, framework, it means 44A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and H. Yes, ma'am. That's right. And so the, the limitations that an awarding authority has in performing its review is between 44A and 44H. That is, the overall award of the contract process must follow the requisites provided for in 44A through 44H in order to award the contract. Part of awarding the contract requires an assessment of responsibility. And so we know that to assess responsibility, it must be done within the confines of 44A through 44H. When you go to 44A1, it defines responsible. And it says responsible, you know, it, it uses words like uh, you know, experience and, and uh, skill and integrity. And, and that the awarding authority is supposed, and DCAM are supposed to follow the procedures set forth in 44D. Right. So that's, w when you ask, there's nothing that limits the process, I would say when, when the statute says the contract can only be awarded pursuant to 44A through H, that's the limitation. And then 44A1 tells us within that limitation you use 44D. And 44D6 says you review the update statement and then the regulations that have been promulgated say DCAM file and contact update statement references. Now one of the, one of the results of the Ward Commission investigations, of course, was the amendments to this, were the amendments to this statute, was one product. The other was the establishment of the Inspector General's Office, whose responsibility is to oversee uh, the awarding of contracts in Massachusetts. The Inspector General has filed an amicus brief here, taking a very different view of this. What do you say about that? Well, I, I, I think that the Inspector General's position here <coughs> is, is uh, somewhat surprising in light of the fact that there is, there is no um, information that it is promulgated suggesting to awarding authorities that they are ever supposed to do what the town of Holliston did here. In fact, in the language that is cited, in, it's in either the town's brief or the attorney general inspector general's brief, to the inspector general manual says only that awarding authorities are supposed to contact the references listed in the update statement. Conspicuously absent is any reference to awarding authorities being supposed to go outside and contact references from prior to the date of certification. And, and, and Your Honor, to, to, to provide some additional information in response to a question you asked earlier, which was why shouldn't they be allowed to go backwards? 
Yeah, to contact the, the contractors or the awarding authorities on all of these listed projects, some of which are graded high, some of which are graded not so high? I, I, I would suggest that that type of process where an awarding authority, as I said earlier, can do whatever type of investigation it wants. I'm not talking about whatever type of investigation. I'm, not, <coughs> I'm talking about contacting those individuals involved in prior projects. But, but, Your Honor, once you say you can contact people from prior projects and that's not prescribed within Section 44D, you're then saying, aren't you, I believe, you can do whatever as long as it is not an abuse of discretion. And that's the problem. That was the problem back well, you before have to, the I, I don't, I don't, I don't know about that. You can do whatever. I mean, you can take the product of those contacts, that investigation, bring it back to the awarding authority. They can consider it, give the contractor an opportunity to respond to the comments, and, and then make a determination as to whether or not, in light of those comments and the other things in the file, this is a responsible bidder for the project at hand. But, but that then we're assessing that process based on whether the, the town's review was arbitrary and capricious. Right, and that's, that certainly is, a, is, is a, 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 an avenue of challenge. That is an avenue of challenge. Uh -huh. I would suggest that uh, based on where we were before the Ward Commission, that is an insufficient manner of challenge by itself. That, the ward, that back in the pre-ward days, you had this exact process in place that led to the problems. The ward commission recommended changes, and we have the changes in the, uh, that resulted in the current statutes before us today, which, Your Honor, specifically provide that all of this type of information is going to be reviewed. It's either going to be reviewed by DCAM or it's going to be reviewed by the awarding authority. Now, one of the questions that's been posed uh, in the past to me is, doesn't the process that Barr suggests require, uh, potentially require awarding authorities to turn a blind eye towards certain information? That is, what would happen if an awarding authority as part of its review process opened up the newspaper one day, having coffee in the morning, opened up the newspaper and found that that contractor had been indicted on allegations of fraud? What are they supposed to do? It's not in the DCAM certification file. Maybe it's not in the update statement. What are they supposed to do with that information? Well, the answer I would submit is simple. There's, there's two avenues pursuant to which that information could possibly be reviewed. One is if the allegations concern projects that, are the, that have either been completed since DCAM last certified the contractor or are, or are alleged to have occurred on ongoing projects, then it squarely falls within the awarding authority's discretion and duty to follow up with the project references listed in the update statement for those projects. So if it's for, for the allegations concern issues on ongoing projects or projects completed since certification, the awarding authority is going to be reviewing that and can use that information, as long as it's reasonable, to reject a contractor as, from being responsible. But what provides that information and in the update statements? The contractor provides. So if the contractor doesn't provide all the information that's necessary, how does, how does anyone uh, have anyone to um, follow up with well, other than whom the contractor suggests? Well, if, if, for instance, the references listed by the contractor on the update statement are not indeed the appropriate references, then it would be providing inaccurate uh, information. And inaccurate information, substantive inaccurate information provided in the update statement is grounds alone for uh, rejecting a contractor, it's grounds for decertification, it's grounds for suspension, How it's grounds for How would someone know that they weren't the right people to contact? W or that the information was inaccurate? Well, the update statement... If that's the only information that they're allowed to contact. Well, the update statement requires that the contractor list uh, the designer and the project representative. And, and, if the contra and if the awarding authority or its designated representative follows up, the first question I presume is going to be, who are you and what is your role on this project? But if those are not the people who would have the information that would, basically the goods on the contractor, the contractor is, pro is providing the names of the people that it wants to provide. Yes. And if there are people who know things that would be disadvantageous to the contractor and it's not listed in the update information, there's a problem. Well, not necessarily, Your Honor. I think that uh, under the update statement review process, if the contractor has not come clean about its information, then it, is dis then it has provided an incomplete or dishonest uh, update statement, and it should be rejected out of hand by the awarding authority. So I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I don't I see that that would talking, be... I think we're not talking, I don't think we're talking about the same thing. I'm talking about a contractor who knows that the people who he's listing, it's listing on the uh, update statement, 
are going to provide, are basically friendly sources? Well, they have to be the designated people. And whether they're friendly or not, they have to be designated people. You're and saying so, that there are categories of people that are required to be designated. The update statement lists that exactly. Mm -hmm. and, and what if your parade of horrible involves a, a project already completed? Well, then the answer is DCAM is supposed to be vetting that information, Your Honor. And DCAM has authority, even after it is certified a contractor under Chapter 44C, to suspend or debar a contractor based on new information under 44D5. It has, uh, it, it's been charged with the, uh, the authority to amend a certification if additional new information comes to light. And under the regulations uh, 4.09, it is supposed to amend or decertify a contractor. So in if your you example, if DCAM doesn't, you know, doesn't read the paper or just doesn't get its act together to act in a timely way before you're, you need to decide who, you're the awarding authority and you need to decide who to award this contract to. What do you do? Well, the awarding authority, under my example, Your Honor, w would presumably contact DCAM and say, hey, do you know about this information? Have you considered it? What are you doing about it? And what the legislature has determined is, is that in providing a centralized, comprehensive, uh, but limited review process for the awarding authorities, it has also provided a comprehensive, detailed review process in which it charges a centralized authority, DCAM, to conduct this examination, and DCAM is the authority charged with doing that. Just one last question. Certainly. You've been focusing on the update statement. There's also a certification file. And my understanding from the regs is that DCAM can look uh, as a sampling of prior projects, not necessarily all of them. When and then, and that the, uh, the additional r requirement is that the awarding authority inspect the certification file. It, doesn't that suggest that there's more that they can do rather than just read what there is, if they can go further than I, look at the information obtained from a sampling? I don't believe so, Your Honor, for a couple of reasons. One is I believe the plain language for inspect is to carefully review. And in fact, when you look at the regulations concerning inspecting, and re it, it says inspect in one spot and review in another, it charges the uh, awarding authorities to actually go to DCAM's office to review the DCAM <coughs> file. Notably absent is any reference to, to taking further steps to contact uh, project references or other town representatives. The DCAM file contains all of the evaluations for the awarding authority going back. It should be limited to five years, but point of fact, a lot of times DCAM uh, includes greater number of evaluations than five years back. So there is a complete review allowed for the awarding authority. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, David Dineski for the town of Holliston. The premise of Barr's argument here is that a statute that directs an awarding authority to do certain things necessarily restricts it from doing anything else. And this question has already been raised during my brother's argument. The fact that the awarding authority is to review the update statement as directed by statute and is directed in the DCAM regulations to review the update statement and the certification file that DCAM maintains does not, under any reasonable, conceivable basis of interpretation, equate to thou shalt not look at anything else, thou shalt not contact anyone but, else. But, okay, but there is a risk, is there not? that uh, when thou contacts uh, these other authorities, that uh, the awarding authority does a bad job, uh, talks to people, I mean, as alleged here, talks to people who don't have personal knowledge of the contract, um, talks to, uh, you know, I mean, you, you can, you can uh, posit a variety of horribles. And so to the extent that the statute uh, and, and the scheme that it enacts is designed to have a uniform system and one that everybody, I mean, th the argument that you have a level playing field, everybody knows uh, where the sources of information are, doesn't it get uh, a little messy around the edges if you, I mean, if you take your example uh, to an extreme? And, and nothing that you say would, pre would prevent an awarding authority from going to that extreme. 
No award can be the same as another award if it's the awarding authority as Barr concedes who is the ultimate decider of who is a responsible contractor. Different municipalities will have different resources based on skill sets of persons that live within the community, the size of the community, experience with other projects. So no one project can ever be evaluated in the same way. Well, right. but, you, but you've got a, you've got a situation where uh, through the DCAM process, you have professionals in the field evaluating the qualifications of contractors on a uniform basis. Um, in your case, I think you're, the town had an architect who also did a, a review of the bidders and sure. concluded that they were all qualified. Okay, so I'm saying you have a professional looking yes. at it, and then you had a, a police officer or detective, or I, I don't know what his rank was, contacting various people associated with jobs and getting some different information on which you determined to act. Um, well, police officers may be very good at, at investigating crimes, maybe not so great at evaluating uh, contractor performance and subcontractor performance and things of that sort. I mean, isn't, is, doesn't this throw this process open for abuse? I would suggest not, Your Honor. In this case, Detective Todd gathered information. He was not the ultimate decision maker here. He gathered information. He provided that to the town administrator who, as evidenced by his report, clearly understood what was the essence of the public bid laws. He cites the statutes in his report to the building committee. He cites the Inspector General's manual. So this was not a case of someone who was ignorant or ill-informed who did not have quote-unquote experience in construction. The decision... I'm not saying they were ignorant, but you know, it's a de I don't have much experience in construction. I'm not an engineer. Or an that's architect. true, but if the elevator breaks this morning or the stair breaks when we step on it, we know there's a problem. And so we can convey that information to someone else who has additional skills and who can make an evaluation is then in a position to decide what else should we know? And that's exactly the question that Your Honor asked previously. Why should the awarding authority be stopped in its tracks when a question comes up? If it is to contact references on the update statement, if it is to review the DCAM certification file, it's clearly going to be the case in some instances, and I would suggest in the majority of them, that there may be questions that arise that are not answered by the materials in that file or the person's to whom contact is made. What is the awarding authority to do? We have to stop according to Barr's interpretation of the statute. And that puts us truly back where we were when the Ward Commission issued its report <coughs> because it said we have a system in which awarding authorities are helpless because they are restricted, they are awarding contracts to the low bidders, there is corruption, favoritism, et cetera, they are helpless to do anything about it. And if we are to say now to awarding authorities, you can't do any more than X and Y, and if a question is raised which would cause a reasonable person to want to inquire more, that's too bad. You can't inquire any further. And I would suggest to the court that that is precisely not what the public bidding statutes are about. Well, what are the limits then? The limits are does the awarding authority act reasonably? But that means you have to always have an after-the-fact proceeding, which is, seems to me is incredibly expensive, time-consuming, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, if it were to be presumed that the awarding authority is not going to act reasonably, which is not the case, the law presumes that the public officials will diligently carry out and honestly carry out their duties. And if we are to take a system and posit that we are dealing with the imaginary horrible all the time, then this process and loads of other processes that are enshrined in the statutes that call for evaluation and determination would all be thrown into question. This is a process in which there are guidelines. But to say to the awarding authority, you must put on blinders and you must close your ears when you get to a certain point, does not do anything to ensure that the public fist is protected. It also does not do anything 
to protect this equal footing principle that Barr makes much of in this case. Every contractor is different. As I said, every awarding authority is different. And each contractor will bring to the table different advantages. And in some instances, one of those advantages will be that when the awarding authority does a reference check, it will find very little because there will be good reports. For other contractors, the history may not be so good. And it is incumbent upon the awarding authority, and so says the Inspector General, and so says the Attorney General, that when those questions arise, it is appropriate to make further inquiry. Because to not do so is to abdicate responsibility. Now, if you do make that inquiry, is there any obligation to let the high bidder know the information that you develop so that the bidder has an opportunity to respond to it? You mean low bidder? I'm sorry, the low bidder. That would certainly be a part of a fair process, yes. Okay, is and, that what and, was and, done and, here? And, yes. Barr had an opportunity to attend a building committee meeting and to subsequently submit written materials. And in that process, the building committee deferred its decision to make a recommendation to the selectmen who were the ultimate uh, awarding authority officials here. And Barr submitted pages and pages of material. And, and if, if that had not happened, if Barr did not have an opportunity to respond, would that make the additional inquiry inappropriate? It would not make the inquiry inappropriate. And again, we, we can't, I would suggest to the court, have a cookie cutter approach to this because each project will be different. And it may be that the imaginary horrible is, as my brother suggested, that the newspaper is opened one morning and there is a story about an indictment. But, but, but for you, the imaginary horrible is somebody who is a buddy of the second low bidder, calls the second low bidder and says, what do you know about the low bidder? and receives information only from the second low bidder and then passes that information on as new information which goes to the responsibility of the low bidder. That's, the, that's for you the horrible that you need to address. That could happen in any situation. It's not alleged here, but it could also happen at the DCAM level. There could be contractors of a certain qualification level because contractors are certified at both a total aggregate limit and a project size and there are only so many contractors who work at the higher levels. So there is certainly opportunity at any point in the process for improper contact, improper conduct. Again, if we are to assume the worst about the system, then well, we really have more of a problem than we're dealing the war, with the today. The Commission reflected that one needs to assume the worst in order to avoid the worst. It, so uh, one needs to recognize the uh, that there is the dangers of the flesh with respect to bidding. Uh, is there any, I mean, uh, I'm trying to understand what your, you say there are no limits, but it seems as if it would be an appropriate limit to say when there is additional inquiry, when there's additional information, that information must be provided to the low bidder so that the low bidder has an opportunity at least to address whether or not that information is reliable. I guess we may be speaking in slightly different approaches. I, I think that that would be part of what would have to be a reasonable process. If the awarding authority finds that information, it is only fair to communicate that to the bidder so that there is a chance to respond. Because is, the is there any obligation uh, uh, of, of the, the awarding authority to communicate that information to DCAM so that it can correct its files if necessary? When the awarding authority rejects a bidder or finds a bidder not responsible, it is required to notify DCAM. The discretion to do so otherwise is exactly that. But the Ward Commission talked specifically about the sharing of information and so that Community A should not be prejudiced because it didn't know information that Community C found out before it got into DCAM's hands. And so more inquiry and not less inquiry promotes all of the interests that the Ward Commission sought to support and to see enacted into the legislation. Can I ask you a factual question, and I, it just may be that I'm not remembering right, but you said, I think, in response to Justice Gant's question that um, um, this information was provided to Barr, and Barr responded with pages of materials, I, I believe you said. Yes. Right? Um, I thought that uh, Barr had alleges that the that the awarding authority um, 
either didn't fully take into account what it had submitted or the appropriate people didn't see it, the architect maybe? I just wonder if you might. Um... The building committee members received the information. I don't believe that it's in the appendix, but I know because I was there that at least one and I believe the two building committee members who were deposed testified at their depositions that they read the material. And the architect? The architect, his letter of April 2nd, 2008, says based only on contact of references contained in the update statement, I don't find that I can say that these three contractors that were reviewed are not responsible. It was certainly not an endorsement and his examination was limited because he noted also in his deposition that his review was circumscribed by what was in the update statement and it was the town through the person of the town administrator who reviewed the DCAM certification file. I take it at this point, the, the, really the only question before us is the narrow one as to whether or not the awarding authority uh, had the authority to conduct this investigation, right? And the question of whether or not the authority then acted in an arbitrary or capricious fashion in its process is still open for the trial. That, that, yes, that's open under the complaint. And the very right. narrow question here is where the statute and the regulations say what they do, does that mean that the town of Holliston or any other awarding authority could go no further? Right. That a wall was put up and that it must close eyes and ears when information suggesting a problem arises? Because the allegations, as I understand it, at least in the complaint, is that the town, yes, did investigate it in a way that maybe was uh, not totally appropriate and didn't investigate others to the same extent. So those issues haven't been sorted out yet. They have at not. the trial court. That's right. This will go back if, if, if we conclude, well, this will go back to the trial court one way or the other. Yes. In conclusion, the system for awarding of public contracts is very important. Its integrity must be preserved. We are dealing ever more rapidly with a situation in which there are fewer and fewer dollars that can be spent on projects. And wasted time and wasted money serves no one. It certainly does not serve municipalities or the state agencies or even the contractors. The awarding authority has a duty to investigate, to act on behalf of the citizens and on behalf of the Commonwealth. And that duty should not be circumscribed by an interpretation of the statute that is unsupported. Thank you.